Oh, yeah, I, like I said, I have my volume down, but um, I'm a research scientist at Ohio State. My um, work is primarily in um, genomics and bioinformatics, uh, and I use R in, in various uh, ways there, but um, I, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different today, uh, and that's some, uh, it's something that's a little bit out of my comfort zone, frankly, uh, but that's some efforts that I've been trying to make uh, in wading into the world of science communication. Uh, and thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, how R has played a little bit of a role in that. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is, is first is just to try to set the stage and give some idea of why I've gone down this path uh, in the first place. Uh, I just wanted to highlight two things here that, that I've kind of experienced myself, and I kind of suspect that um, some of you can relate to one or both of these uh, over the past eight or nine months or so. And um, so... And the first is that back in March, um, my, I got new office space, um, and uh, mine came equipped with a three-year-old on a lot of days, especially on uh, early on when childcare was a little bit hard to come by. But um, if you, you can see that I, I'm working in terminal there, but if you zoom in and look really close, there, there is an RStudio window open under there. But um, I, you know, for me, the, the transition to working from home was uh, fairly smooth with, with, I'd say, one exception. And that exception was that one of my roles at OSU is to try to provide some training um, to our researchers, mostly in the context of bioinformatics uh, and uh, just working with their data. And generally those trainings looked something like this. They were these typically smallish groups, um, but uh, in-person workshops. And we were doing, uh, quite a few of these up through, uh, up through February. Uh, but then of course it became apparent that that setting wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna uh, be likely to uh, be available at least for some time. And so I made a decision to, um, instead of that, to, to start trying to take some of the content from those workshops and, and make it available in video format. And uh, so I just adopted YouTube as a platform to to, to put those videos up and um, and started learning learning YouTube a little bit, um, developing a, a new skill set of you know recording and editing and and captioning videos and all those fun things that I probably never would have been doing otherwise. But so that's the first thing that I wanted to highlight: just you know the, the move home and um, and uh, then then moving into starting up with YouTube. Uh, the second thing, again, might be something that a lot of you can relate to, at least to some degree, uh, and that was that I was spending a fair amount of time scrolling through my social media feeds, and um, at least to the degree I could tell, um, seeing a lot of cases where data were, um, we'll just say, maybe not being used in the best way. And so this is, uh, I've just got a couple of examples here. Uh, this is one where and this is an article that was linked in a post that I ran across. Uh, and uh, the headline of the article, this is strange, total U.S. deaths in March 2020 are actually down 15% from average of prior four years. Um, I, I guess as any headline, uh, good headline should, this might grab your attention a little bit because uh, it, it is, might seem a little bit strange, especially in the, in the middle of a pandemic. You might not expect that pattern. Um, it could be possible, but, um, but uh, maybe not what you'd expect. So I, I'm... I'm always curious about the data I, I looked. And if you look in this article, the, the data are coming from a, a website that CDC maintains. Um, but if you go to that website, and uh, one of the first things that you, you're met with is this big gray box in the middle of your screen, this disclaimer with a, a bunch of information about the data. And uh, one of the points that they make, actually in a couple of places, is the collection of the complete data is, is not, might, probably isn't going to be expected at the time of the initial report. And if you look at um, the date on this article, April 9th, uh, that's, that's pretty soon after, you know, the data that they're talking about here from, which would be from March 2020. And so at least it was reasonable to think at this time that, that maybe this wasn't a real safe inference to be drawing, uh, that maybe there, there's some bias here in terms of those March 2020 numbers and, and uh, that they're, they're biased downwards just because they don't have a complete data set that they're working with at the time. And, and indeed, you know, if you look back at this data set now, uh, this headline doesn't doesn't hold anymore. Um, one more kind of example that that uh, that I, I ran across that caught my eye 
Um, this is a plot that, that is generated, um, actually still generated, I think, every week by a local health department here in a, a report that they put out every week. Um, and it's just plotting number of, of COVID-19 cases again uh, in the area. And um, somebody had grabbed this, this plot, uh, this was back in April, and they were basically using it to, to make this argument at the time that the number of cases uh, were basically going down or what they say were negligible um, in recent days. And, um, and you know, you can kind of see where they're getting this from uh, because if you look at the, the, the heights of the bars here on, on the most recent days, they're, they're clearly smaller, right? And um, the one possible potential problem with that, at least though, is that, you know, if you think about this, this is plotting date of illness onset, and you can imagine that, let's say, this, this, so this post was on April 17th, that you see up here in the top. Um, so let's say this plot was, was released on the, this, this graph was released on the 17th uh, in the, that new report. Um, you can imagine that, that somebody who started feeling sick on the 16th, uh, their date of onset, um, the, the chances that they had, you know, that they had gotten to a doctor or maybe gotten a test uh, gotten results from a test, and those results had actually gotten to uh, the group that was putting this this figure together in the report. You know, the chance of that happening that quickly probably not real high, and so you you would probably expect these uh, these numbers in the more recent dates to be smaller. And it's probably just not a real safe, again, not a real safe inference um, to be drawing uh, to try to draw any conclusions about what's happening in those more recent dates from a plot like this, um, and. So these are, so this is two examples, right? Um, these just happen to both be COVID-19 examples. This kind of, these kinds of issues are restricted to, uh, to COVID, uh, but they uh, arguably have, have maybe been on, on quite high display during, uh, during COVID in a lot of cases. Um, and I think that's been fairly widely recognized. And we've, um, I, I at least have seen uh, a lot of uh, a lot more calls along these lines for folks who work uh, either as scientists or just work with data uh, in general um, uh, to to make more effort to kind of step out of of our professional circles um, and and talk about some of these things more broadly. And so this is just one uh, one article. This was an opinion piece uh, in the journal Nature back in April. Um, making some of these calls, but the, this is just, like I said, one example. I've seen a lot of these, uh, especially recently, it seems like, um, asking, you know, more, more researchers to become active participants in the public fight against misinformation, uh, swamp the landscape with accurate information, get involved in science communication, those, those sorts of things. And so I think I just, you know, seeing more and more of these, I think I just made something of a, of a conscious decision myself um, that uh, I was going to try to make a little bit more effort to do this uh, because, frankly, I didn't uh, very much before at all and um, was quite happy to just uh, stay in my little science circle. But, um, but I, I, like I said, I made something of a conscious decision to try to, to do more of this and make more of an effort and try to do my little part. And so... Um, of course, at the time, like I said, I, I was, it just happened to be along, uh, around the time that I was uh, trying to establish um, this, this uh, learning YouTube and, and getting some videos up there in terms of the trainings that we uh, try to offer to some of our researchers on campus. And uh, so because that was somewhat the ball was at least kind of rolling with that, um, I just decided to, to adopt that um, for, uh, to, for this, this purpose too and, and to think about this channel uh, as more of a having kind of two branches and they're not really formal branches at all, but um, uh, you know, to have a set of videos that, that uh, are for a more restricted audience um, and then uh, a set of videos that are at least intended for a little bit more broad audience and that those focus more on, um, on communicating science and just uh, communicating how we, how we can work with data, maybe some best practices of, of working with data and um, maybe highlight some pitfalls uh, that are easy to run into and, and likely uh, for folks to run into. So, uh, okay, so of course this is an R talk, right? So what does R have to do with, um, with any of that? And for me, the answer to that uh, is it, it 
kind of falls into this area of, of um, R's ability to create these nice visualizations. And um, I see that as kind of falling into to two subcategories. And the first one is, is really what you'd probably first think of, and that's just simply visualizing data themselves. And R is really good uh, with this, as probably a lot of you are, are well aware. Um, the second one's a, it's similar, but it's, I see it as a little bit different, and that's um, trying to use some of the visualizations uh, that, that R can allow you to use um, to help to try to aid in, in trying to explain these broader concepts related to things like the nature of science and the nature of how we work with data and how we use data to draw inference, uh, hopefully in an appropriate way. And so what I've done is I've just pulled out two examples here uh, where, where I've used some visualizations in R to try to achieve some of these things. And uh, I've, I pulled one out to kind of map, fit in both of those examples. So um, the first example on election data, uh, in this context of what's the significance of one vote, um, that, that's more going to be in, in, in the context of that first, uh, first category where we're talking about just using R uh, to be able to, to present data in, in some nice ways and, and maybe some unique ways. And then the second one, this issue on uh, the video on hydroxychloroquine and, and null expectations and reporting biases, this is a little bit, um, it's a little bit about the issue of hydroxychloroquine that was in the news so much. But really, in my mind, this is more about um, some of these broader issues of how we uh, use null, null hypotheses or null expectations when we think about some data uh, and think about interpreting data and, and how something like reporting biases can come into play. And so it kind of fits uh, into that second category a little bit more. And so these are two visualizations down here at the bottom that were relevant in, uh, in each of those. And I'll um, kind of get into each of those here. Uh, now, so let's start with the election data, and really, this this started this um, this started because I was just personally kind of interested in playing around with some of the mapping capabilities in R I never had before, and so I was just trying to learn those a little bit. Um, and it happened to be around election season, and it made sense to to play with uh, play around with election data. They were easy to easy to come by, and so what I did here is just really some some little hypothetical um, kind of what if scenarios uh, based on uh, data from the previous US uh, presidential election in 2016. And so I've just pulled out some clips uh, of the video that I'll show here to, to try to get the point across uh, of, of where I was going with um, and how I use some of these visualizations. In 2016, the Republican candidate won with 304 electoral votes. Now. Let's consider a hypothetical scenario. For every 25 voters who voted for the Republican candidate in 2016, imagine one of those 25 had cast their ballot in the opposite direction. The new electoral map would look like this, with five states shifting their electoral votes, giving a total of 317 to the Democratic candidate. What about in the opposite direction? Let's say one out of every 25 voters who voted for the Democratic candidate in 2016 had instead voted for the Republican candidate. In that case, again, five states would have changed, this time from blue to red, adding 33 electoral votes to the 304 that were actually received. But the numbers get more striking when we consider some specific states individually. For example, Minnesota would have gone red with a shift in not just one out of 25 Democratic votes, but one out of 62. In Florida, a flip from red to blue would have happened with a change in one out of 76 Republican votes. In Pennsylvania, it's one out of 85. Wisconsin, one out of 103. New Hampshire, one out of 255. And Michigan's 16 electoral college votes would have shifted from Republican to Democrat if just one out of every 392 individuals who voted for the Republican candidate had instead voted for the Democrat. In 26... Sorry, I don't think you want to watch it again. Um, so um, the maps that, that, that were in there, uh, they, those all just came out of this uh, US, map, US map package uh, from R. And, and um, there are several different mapping packages in R. They, uh, you know, probably advantages and disadvantages to different ones. But again, I was just kind of playing around. I, it's my first time with uh, doing much with maps. Um, 
And so this was quite nice, I thought, um, and did some, you know, some tidy, I stuck the tidyverse and ggplot badges in there. US map is actually built uh, on ggplot, it seems. Um, but this is just some example code, and, and you know, what I like about this and, and really about R so, uh, in general is, you know, it makes things easy, makes things that would otherwise be uh, difficult, sometimes makes them quite easy. And so, um, you know, I, I just grabbed some, <clears throat> some vote total uh, results uh, by state from online, read those in, um, uh, calculated the difference between Republican and Democrat votes for each state, uh, and then uh, based on that difference, uh, added just kind of an indicator column here of who won, so R's or D's. Uh, and then it was just a, then it's just as simple as using the plot US map function uh, from that package uh, to, to generate the maps and, and color them by, uh, by the winner uh, for each state. And so like I said, it's really just it really makes something that would otherwise could be challenging, uh, quite, quite easy to do. Uh, and then you can kind of split things out if you want the individual states by just adding this by adding an include argument here. Um, so, so just kind of one way of, of maybe showing data in a, a unique way with, with, with maps. Uh, here's another one though, and this one's more along the lines of what I try to do with a lot of the videos. Uh, and like I said, that's to, to use examples of data that's in the news, but think about them, not just for the example themselves, the, the data themselves, but um, more broadly about uh, these, these more uh, broad concepts of, of nature of science and, and how we work with data. And so, of course, hydroxychloroquine was something that was in the news quite a bit. Um, and and this, this video de does deal with hydroxychloroquine, uh, the data around that a little, but um, again, it's, it's more about thinking about how we use uh, null expectations and, and how reporting biases can come into play. And what I wanted to do to get those points across is, is try to come up with some, uh, I was trying to come up with some visualization to do that. And, and this is what I came up with. Um, uh, and so what I'll uh, do is, uh, again, I've just got some clips of, of the video just you know, kind of piece together here, it's a little choppy, but it'll at least get the point across. Uh, to try to show how I, was, uh, wanted, how I tried to use this, this, um, this visual to, to get at those ideas of, of no expectations and reporting biases. There are a number of doctors who have said they've successfully treated patients with hydroxychloroquine. When we work with data, we have a concept called the null. It's a presumption that the variable you're testing has no effect on some outcome. This scientific presumption of no effect remains intact unless data to the contrary are offered that are sufficiently convincing. Let's first take a hypothetical scenario where without treatment, an average of 1% of people who get some virus die. Now imagine a doctor sees 200 patients with the virus. Here I have a series of vertical white bars. There are 200 side by side and they'll represent the 200 patients. I'll let my computer randomly assign whether each dies or not using that probability of 1%. I'll represent deaths with a red bar. In this specific trial, two died. Then I do it again for another 200 patients. In this case, three died. I do this 20 times, giving us hypothetical data for 200 times 20 or 4,000 patients. There's obviously variability when considering one group at a time. In this case, the largest number was five, and for three groups, nobody died. Remember, this is with no treatment. It's the baseline expectation. If there are a number of doctors each treating hundreds of patients with hydroxychloroquine, we'd fully expect some of those doctors would get a 100% success or survival rate just by chance, even if the drug has absolutely no effect. There are... Okay, so um, again, just to try to get, uh, try to use this as a way to, to think about things like null hypotheses. Uh, no expectations. And this was a pretty simple plot to put together. It's just uh, out of the basic stats package, I simulated some data, uh, and then it's just a faceted uh, bar plot and ggplot. Um, this is all the code that, that goes that went into it. Um, so it's basically just generating a data frame uh, that represents 4,000 hypothetical patients here, 200 from each of 20 doctor's offices, um, randomly assigning uh, alive or dead zeros or, or ones here um, with a 1% probability in this case. Uh, and then just ordering things so that they, they come out in the right order on the plot when in the faceted part of the plot. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's just, like I said, a, a bar plot that's, that's faceted and in, in plot faceted on the, across the 20 uh, doctor, hypothetical doctor's offices. Um, 
And so, um, oh, this is, and so this is what the plot looked like coming out of, of Gigi plot. And then uh, this is just uh, the, the little clip arts didn't come out of R, but those were just for effect and uh, dropped them in in PowerPoint. Um, so again, that's just kind of two examples of, of where uh, I've found R to be quite useful in um, some of my fledgling attempts here at um, at uh, at science communication and and um, and so that's about all I've got. And I don't I know I'm probably running up towards time here, but uh, happy to. We have time. I, I loved your presentation, Michael. I'll just jump right in. So we did have one submitted to the Slido, so I'm going to prioritize that one. Nino, I appreciate that you've been asking questions all day. I've really enjoyed seeing them pop up. So Michael, the hydroxy story was nicely put together. However, I wonder if it wouldn't be easier or more intuitive to use a Bayesian explanation instead of a frequentist one. Oh, wow. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, there, there, I would, I'll say that there are probably many better ways to do it than I've done it. Um, so I, I certainly wouldn't claim to have done it uh, in the best way at all. I, that's interesting. I, I wouldn't have thought about it personally myself in that direction. Um, uh, do it, <laughs> I'd say. Give it a try. Um, that'd be cool. Yeah, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, the other thing I'll just comment out, we'll send you a, a list of these questions, Michael, but Thomas had put in a XKCD comic. So uh, I look forward to opening that link later to see what it is. It's about type one errors with doctors, apparently. I, I know just something that struck me as you were going through your presentation was like, I kept thinking of storytelling, right? Um, and I, I guess like, have you ever thought about your own work that you're talking about here. So there's like this visualization piece, but one of the things I, I was struck by was like, just sort of looking at your visualizations independent of what you were saying. Um, I was wondering if somebody would have drawn the same conclusion, right? I, I guess if you could talk a little bit more about like why you decided to do like, you know, that call to, um, you know, respond to misinformation, right? Why YouTube? Why going with data and visualization? Um, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have a great answer for that. There, there are certainly lots of different routes you could go. And I think, I think, um, why, uh, you know, the answer to why I, I did it this way was because I really just had some inertia because I was, um, in the, in the YouTube mindset with, with some of the, um, uh, with some of the uh, trainings that we were trying to put together and, and we needed a place to put those. Um, and, you know, we had chosen that for those because we were going to do it through OSU's um, kind of platforms, but we realized that, you know, if we're going to put them up, we might as well make them more widely available that through OSU's platforms. They were going to be kind of restricted to, to folks at OSU. Um, so that's not really a, a, much of an answer to your question, but um, uh I think it would, I think one of the things that would be great is to see more and more people doing these sorts of things, preferably people that can do it a whole lot better than I can. Like I said, this is, this is not what I do. I mean, this is what I do in the, in the, usually at, at one o'clock in the morning, um, because that's when I find time to do it. And I'm not quite sure why I'm staying up to do it anyway. But, um, uh, you know, this is certainly not what I'm trained to do by any means. Uh, I, I don't feel like the person that should be doing this kind of thing, but I think um, I think it's worth a lot of us trying to, to make more efforts to do it. And whatever platform works for you, I think is, is a great one to adopt, I would say. I love it. Your videos are awesome. I had a chance to check a couple of them out. Um, we are going to forward one question that we didn't get to, uh, but now we're going to switch over to George.